So I just threw that same, it's the exact same definition. I know it's a repeat, but I, uh, Jen was going to make copies of the handouts for you. You have them in your book there. So I wanted this definition kind of at the beginning of each of the relevant sections, right? So that's, that's what that is. All right. Same, same list you had before. These are the ones we're going to kind of go and talk about in a little bit of, a little bit of detail today. Okay. So bioretention cells and rain guards. Okay. Who knows the difference between a bioretention cell and a rain guard? Anyone want to guess? Size. What? Is it the size? Size. No. A bioretention cell is what we call it when the engineers get their hands on it. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason or other, I can't charge an engineer's salary to design a rain garden. I got to call it a bioretention cell. <laughs> now, I say that tongue in cheek, but really what we try to, the distinction I try to make in rain gardens and bioretention cells is if I'm speaking to the public, I'll just talk about rain gardens, but what, we're really, what I'm really trying to do is a rain garden is a landscaping element. Um, a homeowner, landscape architect, it, it's great to weave into the fabric of the community. A bioretention cell is, is when an engineer actually calculated how much water it can hold, calculated how much, you know, how long that water is going to be in there, and actually certified, yep, it's going to perform a certain way, right? So if you go to tip of the mitt, you've got a bioretention cell, one version of it, but you also have a rain garden at the same, at the same location, okay? So, um, this is a bioretention cell. This is a bioretention cell because both of these uh, are built around existing infrastructure. Um, it's part of a stormwater master plan or stormwater design. These are both rain gardens. Wonderful techniques, homeowner designs, and you kind of see, I, I'm not going to go a ton of detail right now, but you kind of see the effect of maintenance, right? So this one here, relatively, um, you know, people have been maintaining this one. This one here, less maintenance, or people have not been maintaining it, right? It's kind of going, going a little bit more to quote unquote weed, right? So here's some rain gardens in Ann Arbor. Now these are these pictures are 10 years old now. It's the timestamp on there. But Ann Arbor uh, has one of those stormwater utilities I talked about. So they, uh, if you have a homeowner rain garden or a rain barrel, you get money off your bill every quarter. So they actually give you money off your bill. So this is a front yard rain garden right here. The downspouts go into it, small depressional area. Uh, different, only like two or three species are in this one. When this fills up, it just spills over onto the sidewalk and then just kind of runs down the hill. Same thing with this one. This is a side lot rain garden, three plant species in here. This house and this house both contribute to it. When it fills up, it just saturates onto the lawn and continues down towards the road like normal. So these don't have like overflows or under drains. They just are hold as much water as they can, and then the excess continues down the lawn like before. Okay? These are bioretention cells. So this right here, that's an edge drain. So the water comes down here, is intercepted by the edge drain. Actually, again, you want to see one of these, you've got it at the tip of the Middle Watershed Council office. The, the water is collected off the parking lot and it goes into this bioretention cell right here. That's the overflow structure. So when this fills up with water, the excess goes this way so that I'm not flooding out the parking lot when I do get four, five, six inches of rain. It's got a place to go. Okay? I like to point out a couple more things on this one. The plant pallets are very different in these three. This is all the same location. Now these two are similar. That one's very different. The plant pallet here is different because this one here was designed to hold a lot more water. This one here had some bypass system in it. It was a little bit drier. So we expect out, or this was specked out with the different plants because it's a little bit wetter. You can see a curb cut here. That's how water gets into it. It comes down through the stone. You can see an edge drain here. Water goes in the slot drain and then dumps down into the, the cell here. There's a curb cut. These curb cuts are really important because what will happen is that's where all the sediment builds up. Uh, you asked about sand, right? So I just finished. Um, a green infrastructure project in Columbus, Ohio, and they sanded the crud out of their parking lot. They weren't necessarily supposed to, but they did. It plugged up the porous pavement. Now we're just going to vacuum sweep it and it'll, it'll come back out. We'll get it back. But what we did in the rain garden is we had this area right here, and that, you know that's the rain garden. The sand piled up here, and you can get out there with the shovel and get the sand out. So you can get a little four bay area that can collect all that extra sand and cigarette butts before it clogs up your rain garden. Um, I just want to add that one of the rain gardens we did in Bayview, long linear one in front of uh, the 
library mm -hmm. as a series of curb cuts. Um, and that was, you know, for those purposes as well as because of the space we had and the opportunity to get the water in there. So, and that's working really well. Thank you. Is that where brake dust would collect too? I'm sorry, say again? Like brake dust? Oh, not as much because that stuff's really fine. It gets more in the, um, it gets more, um, more suspended in the water. But the, the heavy metals, the brake dust, the, um, the hydrocarbons, the oils, the, that's kind of okay to get down here because the plants will treat that and take care of that. You'll get that, mic, that, that biofilm I was talking about, the microbes. I'm not a biologist, and I'm definitely not a microbiologist, but it, the little bit I do know, it's amazing what, the, like I said, that biofilm and the microbes that are in that soil, what they can do. It's actually kind of interesting. We're working on a study right now with um, uh, an agriculture unit in Detroit to look at the effects of how much water even the microbes will take up. Like you, know, you think about porosity and soil, but actually the more of the nematodes and the, um, the worms and things you have, how much more water that will collect. We actually did a project a couple of years ago with Greening of Detroit, where they did two, two side-by-side -side rain gardens. Uh, well, actually it was native grow zones, I should be a little careful my terminology. But one, they actually seeded with worms. They, put, they threw like 10,000 worms on this 40 by 80 lot the lot was like, it looked like it was alive. All the worms were moving around. But the idea, right, is the worms open up the soil structure and get it ready for the water to come in. And it breaks up the clay because they actually get down in there. So it's just kind of interesting what some of that will do. So what is a rain garden? Well, there's, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail, but when you do a cross section, so this is an AutoCAD design, you've got somewhere between one and three foot of soil. This soil is actually a mixture of sand, compost, and topsoil. Um, the mixture of sand compost and topsoil depends upon your water quality and quantity goals. I won't go into that level of detail, but this is what we would call an engineered soil mix or a bioretention planting mix. You got to be really careful; it doesn't have too much clay. You have to have sand to um, to allow the uh, air oxygen in there, so you don't get a lot of root rot. But you also want the compost to provide the organic matter and kind of act like a sponge. So there's actually a nice mixture of sand, compost, and topsoil that give you what you want, but it really depends upon how much water and how clean that water is and what your soil is underneath of what mixture you get into. And that's a little bit beyond the scope of this introductory uh, presentation, but the planting mix is important. You wanna make sure you get the pH right. You wanna make sure you get the clay content right, the organic content right. And so that's where you, you know, start working with um, landscape architects to get that right. Typically then, on, we have a layer of shredded mulch on top of that. Shredded is important. Wood chips float, okay? Rain gardens are designed to have anywhere from six to 18 inches of ponding. I don't like 18 inches of ponding. I, I'm, I'm much more happier with a six inch, maybe a foot, okay? But if you put like pine bark wood chips, they'll rise up with the water, and if you have an overflow, they'll go right into the overflow. That shredded hardwood mulch, uh, it takes a little time, but it'll kind of weave together and kind of embed with the soil and doesn't float as much. I saw you guys laugh over there. You guys have some issues with floating mulch? No, I, I oh. was surprised that, to hear the, uh, the shredded that made sense and she was just saying, you've heard me say that before. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so shredded is actually really the important part. It still might float a little bit early on, but it'll eventually weave itself together. Um, one thing that's really important with the shredded mulch, especially on rain gardens, is uh, replace it as needed. There is nothing worse in, in, nothing worse in my point of view. Other people can think of other things worse. But um, landscape maintenance contracts that basically call for mulching every single year, that actually doesn't work, right? You see the trees that have 18 inches of mulch built up around them, all you're doing is killing the trees. You're causing root rot and killing the trees. You wanna keep that mulch low to the ground. You replace it as necessary, but if you're shoveling three inches of mulch on this thing, six inches of mulch on this thing every year, you're actually losing your capacity and you're kind of damaging the natural system that's going on there. Um, some sort of pre-treatment is important. It can be stone, it can be grass to keep the sand and the, hard, the larger things out of it. That's really important. Uh, I think I've covered most. Oh, and then you, know, you really do want those native or, um, a, you know, I, I promote natives a lot and sometimes I get in trouble for that. Some people are like, well, what about, native cultivars or you know, native eyes. 
you know, I don't want to get in a giant plant debate. You know, Nate, that's Nate's job. He'll get in a big plant debate with you. But, you know, we are looking for things, though, that are adjusted to our ecology and our hydrology. You know, things that have those deep roots that don't need to be watered all the time. That, that is what we are looking for. Um, if you have bad soils, you have what we would, you can actually have an underdrain. So if you have a lot of clay or things aren't going to go in there, you might put in a, a perforated pipe underdrain in there. You could have a stone layer to provide some extra storage. So you do want to have a way for that water to get out, otherwise um, you could have problems. Most, this is more true in southeast Michigan than west Michigan, but a lot of times when I get called in, I get called in for retrofits because people don't really consider the soils and or the hydrology. And so these things never drain. And so you do have to be cognizant of the native infiltration rate and design your rain garden around it. If you've got good soil, you don't need to have it under drain. But the engineer might put one in anyway because they like to be over cautious and conservative. So it's pretty fun where you are. All right, so that's a bioretention style rain garden. Okay? A planter box. A planter box is effectively a rain garden that you put into a box which is actually a little bit more accurate to what one of the ones you have at, at the, um, at the um, watershed office. Uh, so basically this is more of an urban one. So what you have here, you can see these little slits right here. Those little, that's how the water gets into these. This is like three foot deep. It's got concrete walls, open bottom. I like to show different pictures of plants as well. This is what we would call a monoculture. It's a single plant species. So um, plants are super important, especially the aesthetic look, the maintenance look. I really take that uh, to heart. So this is a, a single plant species right here. Some people have talked about the Michigan Avenue rain guys. We were talking about the ones in Lansing. I might have a picture of that coming up in a little bit. Uh, those have been around almost 20 years. Those are effectively planter boxes because they're in the ground. They can also be above ground. This is in Philadelphia. This little system right here, you can see the downspout. Before the downspout was connected, it went straight to the storm sewer. So like a five minute time of concentration, went right into the pipe, right into the, uh, this was a combined sewer, which you don't have up here. But this act right here added a bunch of time of concentration. So even though this little box doesn't hold a ton of water, it slows it down. Once this fills up, it overflows onto the ground. And once it overflows onto the ground, it'll eventually make its way into the system. But so planter box is just another tool in our disposal. Uh, this is a sedge, I believe. It was basically, again, a, a monoculture, a single, a single um, species. Nate, are you going to show any of the planter boxes they did out at Munson as part of your presentation? No. no okay. Right. They have a few of them out, out at, uh, at the, no, not at Munson, at the, uh, at the uh, asylum. Yeah. 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 Grand Traverse yeah. Pavilions, the commons. Thank you. I was drawing a blank on the name. They have a few of those at the, uh, the commons. So same concept, walled, soil mix, plants, gravel or stone that promotes infiltration but also give you additional storage. Open at the bottom if you have the ability to get that water to infiltrate. If you don't have good ability for that water to infiltrate, you can put an under drain in there so this thing doesn't become like standing water. You don't want standing water. And obviously, one of the questions I get a lot is, what about mosquitoes, what about bugs? If they're designed properly, you're not going to have any mosquito issues, right? Um, they should just drain in 24 to 48 hours. Mosquitoes need, what, 72 to 180 to 108 hours before they'll actually incubate. You get a lot more mosquitoes in clogged gutters on your house and in bird baths than you do in properly designed rain gardens. But I do want to make sure that that's one of the ones that comes up a lot. Okay. So, um, and then you always need an over, for planter boxes, you do need an overflow structure. And once this fills up, the water has to go somewhere. So vegetated swales and bioswales, the big difference between a, a, the rain garden bioretention and a swale is that the rain garden or bioretention cell is at the low point. Water's flowing to it, okay? A vegetated swale or bioswale sucks up the water, but also conveys water along it. It, it, has, it has to also convey water linearly. That's the real difference. I kind of group these into three different vari uh, variations. So you can have like kind of a pedestrian bioswale, like around a park. You can have a roadside bioswale, so the water now is running off the road and, and coming down through this neighborhood right here. Um, or you can have kind of a bioswale in the middle of a parking lot. This is in Wyoming, Michigan. So this one right here, instead of having catch basins, they did curb cuts. So there's your stone that slows that water down. The, uh, the sand and the floatables and the cigarette butts kind of stick in this area right here. 
You can't really see it very well, but immediately down, this was shortly after, this is a couple years after it went in, downstream of each of these curb cuts was a single tree, so you can kind of see the trees you go in here. And then this is actually an engineered soil media. They just wanted, they planted it in grass though. This is kind of a, kind of a hybrid. So you're not seeing like the, the native plants, you're just getting a grass mix in here, and then they just kind of weed whack it. So, but they didn't want to have tall plants. This is, it was a, an aesthetic decision. So downstream of every curb cut, it's a single native, a single tree, and then there's biotension soil in here. But what happens is all that water still flows down this length. So this channel had to be designed to have that water without eroding away. And you can see there's some pretty big rock right here. Okay. In this case, instead of doing curb cuts with rock, they, the water goes through a little bit of turf grass first before getting down into the swale. So um, now here's an example of pedestrian bioswale. What we had here is there's our um, a, a area of, sand, of soil, of that bioretention soil, plants on top, and then an underdrain system. So the water makes its way into an infiltration trench underneath this particular one. So the water then saturates the soil, gets into the infiltration trench. What doesn't infiltrate goes through that four inch perforated pipe. And so you've got uh, some water that never gets through that pipe. When this thing fills up, it then flows linearly along the top. This was designed for a quote unquote um, 10 year storm. We monitored this thing for 10 years like no water ever came off it. It was way over designed. Cause you know, the people were nervous. They wanted to make sure it didn't fail. Street trees and tree box filters. This is another kind of tool in our arsenal at this point. Street trees and tree box filters are very, very different animals. I have no problems with street trees. Street trees are great. The problem is street trees straight up don't serve as much function as like a street a tree box filter. I'll show you the difference in just a second, right? A street tree could be in your front yard just like this, right? But you're just planting a tree. I shouldn't say just, you're planting a tree. You're not designing a system to hold extra water. It's just gonna hold the water that it gets out of the sky or that you direct on it. The problem with a lot of street trees in urban areas is their roots tend to get choked off. And you have to spend a lot of time watering these. You know, you'll see those little green bags that people water or they'll design irrigation systems to keep them alive because of that heat island effect. And so another option is to do a tree box filter. A tree box filter is where the tree itself is taking in storm water. You're directing storm water into it, okay? And so here's a couple options or a couple ideas. So this one right here, the water is going straight into the system. What you don't see, actually, I got another picture. Let me show you. Oh, I did not have another picture. I apologize. I'll just go back. What you're not seeing in this is there's actually a little pre-treatment pre -treat, pre area in the front here that you can then um, clean out. And then the trees take the water inside. This particular one right here, you can see it's a, a kind of an urban area. That little area right there, there's your sand, right? So the sand, the water comes down the gutter, it goes in here, your sand goes out there, and then it gets directed into the street tree. So you're capturing a lot of your sediment here, and then the water's going into the street, uh, the tree box filter there. We just, uh, I'm gonna show you a case study later. We just put a whole bunch of these in Northport. What's the, uh, the the texture on that inlet, why, what is that? This um, that's to keep, this was a steep, basically to direct water into it. Oh, okay. So you're, you're trying to get more water to go in there instead of bypassing it. I was reading it the other way there. Yeah, it's the way the picture's taken, it's kind of, it's a weird, you don't have the, the right angle. You think the water's coming at you, it's actually going the other way. Yeah. So, um, but they all have, there's different things that are happening inside them. This particular, like this type of urban example, Water's coming down the gutter, can go into a curb cut, it fills this up, so it fills up the tree, and then the excess goes back into a traditional kind of urban system, right? When you have areas with lots of sediment or sand, like you do in, in northern Michigan, we like to put a catch basin in the front. That catch basin is gonna fill up with sediment, uh, that's where that's where you can then vacuum out and then it overflows into the street tree and that's what we put in northport and i'll show you some of those pictures later as we did that um what else do i want to say about this they take a little getting used to so they put some in traverse city right in one of the marinas and they did this kind where the water spills right into the tree as opposed to having like some pre-treatment and so this was clogging up with cigarette butts and trash and sediment 
I highly, highly recommend that pre-treatment for any place where you're gonna have a lot of debris or sand to get that place with it so you're not kind of clogging this up. The other thing is this distance from that street grate to the, to the bile, this is where the water's gonna go, right? So that's gonna be 12 to 18 inches. So those trees start kind of down. People are used to seeing the tree, people are used to this, right? Where the tree's right there. So these are set down in there. So it takes a, either A, have to start with a bigger tree, a bigger caliper tree, because if you start with a smaller cal caliper tree, it's like down in a hole, and that kind of throws people off a little bit. So you do want to kind of specify a little bit bigger tree to start with. So, because I, I think you know what I'm getting at. A six foot tree will look like a four foot tree, and the street tree that comes up here doesn't quite look right. Right, so that, that's one of the issues they also have in Traverse City. People are like, why'd you plant bushes? <laughs> well, you know, give it a few years, there'll be trees. So, all right, infiltration trenches and galleries. So basically, there's two ways this works. So one is you can feed the water into the gallery. You can do like a runoff. So you can have sheet flow coming off of pavement and then go into porous pavement. And then the porous pavement would have stone in it. And that stone then exfiltrates or has the water infiltrate into the ground around it. The other thing you can do is actually use, so this pipe can work two ways. One is it can be an under drain. So that's where the excess water goes out. Two is you can actually pipe water from downspouts into these trenches and then let it seep out. Okay, so the water can actually come in the pipe or the water can go out of the pipe. Just two different uh, variations on a theme, right? And so the way they basically work is either the water, you know, you basically are holding that water in that trench and then you're slowly releasing it over a 24 to 72 hour period into the native soils around it. And we size all of these things according to the infiltration rate of the soil and the size of the parking going into them. What yeah. storm event? Sorry. What storm event? Um, it depends on what, you're gonna, what your goals are. Uh, you can, I, they can be two, two to ten years. Okay. Two year to ten years, so well, typically. The local municipality or yeah, yeah. Uh, well, they, I think the ones in Sutton's Bay were 25 or 50 years ago. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Jen? Um, just want to, at Tip of the Mint Watershed Council at our office, we have an infiltration trench or basin at the back side of our parking lot that takes roof water from our second story structure down and discharges it below ground. So the gravel area that people always wonder why we didn't bother paving that, that's part of their infiltration, infiltration trench. So that's, just, I'm gonna do a whole presentation on this later, but um, these are some of the infiltration trenches that went in um, in Sutton's Bay. So these are long galleries. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to figure out how much I wanna get, level of detail I wanna get in here. Um, so basically these types of systems can be for 50 year storm, 100 year storm. You're basically sizing it like a detention pond, but putting it underground, right? This type of system here could be for a smaller two inch, three inch rain. These are gonna be for your, your five and six inch rains, your very large rainstorms. This is what's called a header row or an isolator row. The water comes down that row first. That's where any sediment, debris, or things you need to clean out go into. Then it feeds these rows down here. The water fills up in these arches. The um, around it's filled with stone, so you will have stone will eventually go in all of this. So the water is held inside these pipes or arches. It's also held around the stone. It slowly infiltrates into the sand around it. If it does get overwhelmed, there's an overflow structure that'll take it to the bay or take it to the downstream. All of the sand will get backfilled on top of it. A lot of times you'll see these under parking lots or under athletic fields because it's a very good place. You know, you'll have them underneath the, uh, the football, uh, football pitch, football field, um, and then the, uh, or under parking lot. So uh, especially in urban areas where you don't, where parking is so critical, they may not have room for a pond, they'll put these underneath their parking. The issue is once you backfill this, you can't see it. Right, so they do have inspection boards, so you can go in there and look to make sure it's performing, but the public doesn't know it's there. Good or bad, they just don't know it's there. So, so this is the, this is what we did in North, uh, I keep talking about Northport, I should, I'm gonna do a case study. Later. This is basically what we did in Northport, is this is what I meant by pre-treatment. So the water is coming down the gutter and it goes into a traditional catch basin, like you can see anywhere else. It fills up that catch basin first, 
there's what there's a two foot sump down here that sump is where all the sediment's going to fill out that's where i can pump it out at the end of the year it then feeds the gravel trench in between the trees and the trees are there to soak up that water so you evapotranspirate some of the water you infiltrate some of the water and underneath where people are walking is stone filled with water okay and so this is a really good tool in our kind of urban uh, arsenal of two of, of you know so instead of just having a street tree you're actually having a tree box filter infiltration trench you're kind of integrating the whole system here does that tree have to be um like highly water it's not highly water tolerant, but when you um, when you kind of like we use crab apples, we use crab apples in, in um, uh, for Northport. There is when you work with the manufacturers of these systems, they have like a, a specification list. Here's the trees we recommend. Okay, um, and so like people love crab apples. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily throw. I mean, I don't, I don't want to get too much into it because I don't know all the do's and don'ts. Um, but you know, for example, you're not going to put a Bradford pear in this, right? I mean, a Bradford pear is, is not a native species. I mean, one of the things we're trying to promote is the, the species that can do do well in this environment. Permeable pavement, okay? So permeable pavement. There's several different varieties. The first one is permeable asphalt. <coughs> so permeable asphalt. Um, this is in Farmington Hills, Michigan. This is in Philadelphia. This is actually in the South. But what you can do is the whole parking lot or the whole street can be permeable like this. You can see that's the impermeable, so water is actually flowing off into this. That whole parking lot's in, uh, permeable asphalt. Or you can have a traditional drive lane that's impermeable, the regular asphalt, and the parking stalls are permeable, so the water kind of flows onto it, right? So permeable asphalt is one example. This stuff does work in, um, in frozen environments. This is a tour that we did. What happens is, a couple things happen with this. So one is that you get that albedo effect, you get the heat. So even if it's below freezing out, sun can heat up that system. And even a little bit of sunshine, I know it doesn't have a lot in Michigan, but even a little bit of sunshine can open this up a little bit and get that, those pores ready for water. People ask, well, how, you know, doesn't this stuff do really bad in winter? It actually doesn't. So one of the things that happens, right, one of the reasons we have so many problems, uh, actually more in the southern part of the state than up here, but up here as well, is traditional pavement is not meant to have any water in it, right? And so if a little bit of water gets in there, it's got nowhere to go, and when it freezes, uh, freeze, especially the freeze-thaw action, it starts breaking it up. So one of the reasons that we have more issues with infrastructure now than we did even like in the eight, 70s and 80s is we're having more freeze-thaw cycles. So this is one thing that people don't talk about a lot. It's, um, our winters are quote-unquote getting milder, but the issue is for the roads, it's actually better if it gets freezing and doesn't and stays freezing for months, right? The 1970s were better on roads. Now, you're getting those 60, 70, 80 degrees in March, right? And then you're getting the freezing again. And what, we had snow and Boyne was open in, in the first week of May. So the freeze-thaw cycles are really killing the stuff. This stuff here is designed to have water in it. It's got big pore spaces, so the water has room to expand. So there's actually room for it to expand and then freeze and thaw. So it doesn't actually break up very much from the three so it's all actually not like traditional asphalt does. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, when we try to suggest to the planning commission that they mm -hmm. use permeable surfaces, mm -hmm. there's two objections. A, it's adds cost. Mm -hmm. And B, it's a problem with snow removal. Okay. So um, there's a few things. So I'm going to come back to that. Let me run through all the versions. I know we won't come back. We'll talk to it right now. So what was, what's their problem with snow removal? What's, what's the they problem? They don't think the plows, that'll be an uneven surface, that's okay. my impression. Yes, okay, so these surfaces, the best way, if you're not familiar with them, especially concrete, these surfaces are the um, texture of Rice Krispie treats. Okay, they are a rougher surface, right? So as far as maintenance goes, you really have two choices for plowing. One, is rubber tips. So put a rubber tip on your plow blade so that you're not dragging the metal over it. Two, raise your plow blade up a little bit. And sometimes people actually put like these little like uh, discs on there to make sure their plow blade doesn't touch it so that you leave a little bit of snow. You're actually not plowing the bottom. You're leaving you know, a quarter inch off it. And what happens is because this is a rough surface, even if you're leaving a little bit of snow on there, you are not losing all the traction. 
So what happens in traditional asphalt, it's real slick, right? This stuff, it is rougher. And so because it's rougher, um, if you leave a little snow on there, you don't lose all the traction you would otherwise lose, right? So it, you do have to be, you have to have a softer touch. I'm not gonna deny that. If you put your blade on there, you're gonna rip the crap out of it, okay? So that is, now as far as it costing more, yes, it costs more, but here's the trade-off, right? If you have this type of stuff, the water's not running into your system, so your pipes are smaller. Like, you, you know, it, it's kind of, you have to look at like life cycle cost. You have to look at the big picture cost, right? So this stuff here requires a lot less salt than traditional because it's rougher, because it actually, you know, so this parking lot here is not being salted at all, but you can see this is what happens, right? This was, this thing, I was out there on this day, it was below freezing. So the city of Farmington Hills, they're being gentle with their plows on this. They're not salting this. And so the, a little bit of sun comes out, even on not a full sunny day, um, the water, the snow melts and goes into the ground. So you save some money on salt, uh, you save some money on traditional infrastructure. There's no catch basins, there's no metal grates. I mean, a catch basin structure is gonna be a couple thousand dollars. The grate from East Jordan Ironworks is 500 bucks. Right? I mean, so you, if you just do a square foot to square foot, yep, this stuff's always gonna cost more. If you look at the whole package, it's more equivalent than you, than you might think, okay? So you absolutely can't use salt on... No, you, you can. You can use salt, but this stuff... So the stuff is not meant to be heavily salted because you, you know, the water does go into it. Because any salt you put on this, now it's going straight into the ground. You just want to be a little gentler with your salting. Like, I mean, that, that's part of it. You know? Or use um, some uh, less lower chloride alternatives that we kind of talked about earlier is another option. Or what about sand? So, so sand will clog the stuff right up. And now you can get the clogging. You can, if you vacuum it, you can get that sand back up. Let me, you know, I'm going to jump ahead a couple slides. I won't answer your question. Cause I'll show you the, I'll show you the, what I like. I'll, I'll show you what I like in just a second. So there's porous concrete is another option for you. Um, you got to really be careful with the salt because you can actually break down. Like if you, um, you can actually start breaking down the cements on this stuff. You have to be pretty careful. Concrete paper blocks. So these are, these are paved drain. These are in, um, that's actually in Grand Rapids. These are another kind of concrete paper block. So, simplistically put, I am a much bigger fan of the concrete paper blocks. They're more durable. I can lay a metal blade right on this. You'll, you'll uh, leave rust stains on them, right? But you don't, have to, you don't have to raise your blade up on this. You don't have to um, you know, use a rubber tip blade. Whatever you do, this is, gonna, you know, this is made out of concrete. They're just solid, heavy concrete block. The water goes through these gaps here. You can kind of see that articulated gap. The water goes through these gaps. If this gets clogged with sand, the water has an outlet. It's got a place to go. That's your overflow structure right there. If you vacuum this in the spring, whatever sand's in these little gaps will come back out. So you'll get the rejuvenation properties of it. Uh, the city of Grand Rapids has done a whole bunch of porous concrete parking lots as well. They've held up really good seven, eight years now. They've held up very, very well. They, they, they do, they're more careful, they don't salt it as much, they don't plow it as much. Um, you gotta be careful. So the last thing I'll say about this stuff, I can go on and on and on about porous pavement because I know a lot about it. But two things I think to remember. So one is, this, as I mentioned, this stuff's really rough, right? It's not really meant for driving lanes. You don't wanna do whole roads in this stuff. You know, even though I showed you some pictures of entire roads, entire parking lots in it, that's not really the best application. What happens on a lot of this is you think about turning, right? Motion is bad on the, on the porous concrete and permeable asphalt. It basically breaks the surface up, right? So the more stopping, the friction, it just starts breaking apart, right? It's, it unravels. So porous concrete permeable asphalt, much, much better for parking stalls or even portions of parking stalls than it is for main driveways. Because main driving, you're just too much starting, stopping, too much turning, it breaks it up. When this stuff first goes in, it's got permeability infiltration rates of 200 to 1,000 inches per hour. You cannot, I, can, I turn on a fire hose, full blast, and the water goes away. Okay? This stuff can clog 90% and still infiltrate all the water you need it to infiltrate. So it's okay if it clogs a little bit, because in the spring you can come and vacuum it up and you'll rejuvenate it basically. One of the things, and I don't want to tell off of Grand Rapids secrets, but 
A lot of people are telling you, oh, you gotta vacuum this stuff four times a year. No, you don't. No, you don't. Grand Rapids has got porous concrete parking lots that they don't even vacuum every year. But they go years without vacuuming. They just don't tell anyone. Um, you know, because it's supposed to be vacuumed every year. They vacuum it when they notice it's no longer infiltrating. When it stops infiltrating, they'll vacuum it. Now, it is more problematic. This stuff here, I think, is more problematic, uh, the concrete and the asphalt, because um, the fines can get really bedded down in those gaps we were just talking about and harder to get out. The paver blocks, the fines get trapped more in these gaps, and you can get them back out easier through vacuum sweeping. So from a durability point of view, from a maintenance point of view, from a winter point of view, I'm a bigger fan of the concrete paper blocks. Um, permeable concrete asphalt have its place, but this is more what I'm a fan of. Go ahead, Nate. Nate can talk about the stuff as easy as I can. Yeah, one thing that I want to point out that I think is a really good option with the, you know, more of a concrete or the blacktop one is if you had a parking lot that has pooling in it or ponding because maybe it's settled, you can cut a patch out in the lowest spot dig down, build an infiltration, you know, go down to where you can infiltrate, put that, that back on, you know, a top, a, per, a permeable top, and drain that parking lot. So, you know, um, I've talked to Meyer and a few other places about doing that in Traverse City because they have areas that they can't park mm -hmm. because it's under a foot of water because there's a low spot. That was a problem when they originally built the parking lot. So that's, that's a, a, a way to just, um, a maintenance item rather than ripping out a whole parking lot that might be have a ponding area you can do something with that. one thing that's nice about the black the asphalt is the, the the thermal effects it melts a lot faster i mean that's one of the reasons farmington hills likes the uh the asphalt parking lots is because they do melt faster um so the life the other thing with asphalt and concrete is the, the other reason that i'm less of a fan i'm not saying not but i'm less of a fan is you have to get a very good mix. Uh, basically, your supplier and your installer have to be certified and know what they're doing. This stuff, if you don't get the right mix design, you don't get the right installer, this stuff can go south really fast. And so you need to make sure you're working with somebody from the National Ready Mix Association that's certified. Because one of the big differences is you, you don't roll this stuff, right? You're not, you're not packing it down and creating a perfect sheen. You're, you're putting it with a light hand so you want that water still going and you don't want to slink it. So the other thing is I find the paper blocks, they're just, they're more forgiving. If this is uneven, you pull it up, you level it out, you put it back. <laughs> you know, it, it's, there's just, there's a, the paper blocks, they're more expensive, but they're, they're more forgiving. I mean, they, you, they just don't have to be as gentle with them. And you can heat the paper blocks. Which right. is actually a very cool application. I, yeah, I haven't got into that part of it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, real quick, yeah, the, this particular product right here, you can actually run heat loops through it and then you don't use any salt. And that's actually like the city of Holland, Michigan. Anyone familiar with what they do downtown? Yeah, they're using, so Holland, there's no snow removal because all of downtown Holland is, is, un, is heated. Geothermal high heated, so everything just melts and goes away. So um, these types, a lot of um, shopping areas, especially year-round shopping areas, you know, we're getting away from the indoor malls and you're going more of the outdoor malls, are going to these paver block systems and then doing some low level heat underneath them. So when the snow melts, it just goes straight through those cracks and just goes away. So in, back in Ohio, we have like an issue with our brick roads where the ground would move in the cold temperatures and it would create uneven because roads Because of the under drains, right? Okay. They, they, they did not, you have to prep the soil underneath it appropriately. You have to have, a, you have, to have the right amount of stone and that stone has to be laid properly and drained properly. If you're just laying brick on clay, then frosty is going to cause this stuff to go all over yeah. the place. Absolutely. Maybe you're, you're going to mention it. Maybe bit, not. But, but maybe not. <laughs> um, as far as licensing, you know, finding a contractor, we have fewer contractors up here in, in mm -hmm. all, you know, disciplines. So what kind of thing would, uh, what kind of licensing would you want to have for both the concrete and the paper? So. The pavers, I'm actually not aware specifically of licensing. Um, they could probably talk about that a lot better than I could. For the concrete and the asphalt, there's actually the National Ready Mix Concrete Association and the asphalt, I forget the name of the asphalt group, but basically the, the national societies have certification programs and you can 
hire contractors who've gotten certified to place porous concrete or permeable asphalt. It's, it's not really a licensure, it's more of a quality control. I'm not actually aware of the you, paper well, block. Well, the paper right. with the papers you just, with, or there's other types of um, like rubberized based systems as well. Mostly um, what you're going to want to look for is certification from that manufacturer at a very minimum. There might be a national organization too, but at a very minimum that they should be approved to install it um, from the manufacturer, which typically means they've gone through, that contractor has gone through the certification program and they, you know, that manufacturer trusts them to put their product in as specified. So we have about 10 minutes, so I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna pick up the pace here a little bit. So here is your point about this stuff not working. So what's happening underneath, you've got your pavers, you got your bedding layer, then you got a couple, then you got another layer, then you got your stone. And so if you don't have a way for that water to get out either through the ground or through an under drain, then this stuff will heave. And that, that's really, really important, right? So typically, um, even if I got good soils down here, you might put an under drain a foot below the pavers just so that you don't get water kind of standing right underneath these systems, okay? Full infiltration means there's no under drain. You're counting on the good quality soils underneath. If this fills up all the way, then water will sheet flow over the top and go into an overflow structure. So if I go back to Grand Rapids here for a second, that's what that is. If this completely fills up with water, the water goes into kind of a traditional system. So it'll sheet flow over and go into that. Okay, so there's still a way for the water to get out. There's other opportunities for you. These are concrete paper blocks. This is a Hope College and it's hard to tell from this angle, but basically in between these teeth, that's just wide open. So water can go straight in between these gaps, or you can have these gaps here. You can backfill it with stone, you can backfill it with uh, grass, you can kind of do what you want with it. Um, this, uh, this is Hope College right here. It's a good application for kind of like loading bays, overflow parking areas, kind of things you're maybe not parking on every day. It is kind of uneven to walk on. Um, flexible pavement, this is like recycled tire crumb, and, so this is a little bit softer, kind of good for patios or um, walkways, playground equipment sometimes. So there's other pavers out there. Got about six minutes, I'm gonna hit two other techniques. Now you're gonna talk about Vinci Universe a little bit more, yeah, nervous, right? Little, yeah, I mean, I don't go into the technical. All right, then I'll, I'll cut some of the technical stuff on it real quick here. So when we talk about vegetated roofs, so Nate and I have done whole workshops on vegetated roofs together. There's basically two types, extensive and intensive. <laughs> Extensive are shallower profiles, a little less soil, um, not really meant for, I will call human consumption as much. Intensive are thicker, heavier, um, have more intense maintenance requirements and actually might have more human interaction with them, okay? Uh, this is in your notebook, so I'm not gonna go to all the level of detail, but an extensive green roof is typically three or four inches of soil, adds somewhere around 20 pounds per square foot, relatively simple maintenance associated with them, um, they have a, a, a carton, an egg carton system typically, or some sort of drainage system that had, holds that extra water in there and that will, you know, holds it for the plants to take back up. The plants typically are sedums. So that would be an extensive roof right here. You can tell that this is a lot of maintenance. You got full grown trees on this one. Intense re uh, maintenance requirements. That's an extensive roof. People aren't going up on this one. This is purely for stormwater management as well as for um, helping out with the thermal uh, geothermal or thermal heating effects or the insulating effects. Okay, a couple famous ones. That's the Chicago City Hall. That's the Ford Motor Company, uh, the Rouge plant. Okay, vegetation. We typically use mostly sedums. A sedum is an alpine plant. There's a bunch of varieties of sedums out there. They can handle being really hot and baked in the summer. They can handle being really, really cold in the winter. They're alpine plants. Um, you can do different kinds of grasses. You have different colors associated with them. There's different, you know, they can actually be quite pretty, quite attractive. This is a, the reason I like to call it vegetative roofs instead of green roofs is that's not a very green roof. It's, it's a vegetative roof. So I tend to use the word vegetative more than green because you can have different colors associated with it. This is actually in Colorado right there. Um, I'm gonna give my, my quick public service announcement. So I don't rep any green roof companies per se. I don't work for the green roof industry, the vegetable roof industry. Here's what I will say. As a taxpayer, I'm not talking about engineer, I'm not talking about a storm manager. I'm talking about as a taxpayer. As a taxpayer, I am a big fan of vegetative roofs, okay? They're gonna pay for themselves in energy savings 
20 years maybe. I mean, it kind of varies a little bit because energy costs go up and down. We put a, 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 an extensive green roof on our, one of our buildings at Lawrence Tech, and it was estimated to pay for itself in energy savings in about 10 years, right? And that's because of two things, so three things really. One is these things provide tremendous uh, insulation. I'm gonna go back to the cross section, right? This soil, these plants, this is all insulating, right? So you don't lose that heat, that's number one. Number two, a traditional black asphalt roof might be 160, 170 degrees in the summer. This is basically the same as ambient air temperature. So the, the heat exchangers that I do have on my roof, my intakes are pulling in air that's a lot cooler. So even if I do have an HVAC system, instead of that HVAC system trying to cool 160 degree air coming off the black, it's cooling 90 degree air. So you're saving a, a insulation, B, that exchange associated with the air. And then the last one is, as I mentioned, these roofs, they hold that water and they evapotranspirate. How do you cool yourself? You sweat, okay? These buildings basically breathe. So that, that's evaporative cooling associated with it. So while a green roof is, a, is really good for stormwater, you will never ever put a green roof on a building or a vegetable roof on a building for stormwater. It's a great benefit, but you're gonna do it for energy, right? So as a taxpayer, I'm going back to my taxpayer thing, I know this costs more money, but it's gonna save me money from year 10 to year 60. The other thing is a vegetative roof is gonna last twice as long as a conventional roof. Reason conventional roofs break down is UV that sun breaks down those roofs, right? A lot of people are like, oh, you don't want plants on your roof, it's gonna ruin your membrane. It's not, right? It actually, if you do a properly installed green roof, it's gonna protect the membrane. Um, you know, we've got roof, we have a, our roof at Lawrence Hex been around 15 years. We've done no maintenance on it in 15 years. It doesn't leak. I mean, the others, if you get a good contractor putting in a reputable roof, these things don't leak. That's a, that, you know, if you get a bad contractor, you know, Nate can talk about this more than I can. I don't wanna go into too much detail. But basically, a reputable system, reputable contractor, they're not gonna leak. You're gonna have one green roof or two conventional roofs. So when you look at the, the economics of green roofs, it's a no-brainer. It's an absolute no-brainer. If public money's being used, it should have a vegetative roof on it. Um, the hard part is, the upfront dollars are more, absolutely. There's no way around that. But the life cycle cost from year 10 to year 60, you're saving yourself a lot of cash. And there's more and more funding opportunities now especially for municipalities and other types of um, entities like that, where you know you get that upfront money and, and you can depreciate your asset, which is just like you would any other thing on your building in addition to your building. Yeah. So you can depreciate it over many years and make it less cost. And there's actually some companies are getting into basically paying for it, and then you're basically, you know, then you basically pay that back over energy savings. They're basically making an investment Right. in the building. There's a lot of different, as it matures. The Financial strategies. There's a lot of different options, yeah. Um, so I, one of the, one of the, I've worked with a couple school districts in Southeast Michigan that kind of figured it out and they they were able to sell it to their, you know, their voters and the bonds, right, the municipal bonds, um, the school bonds. But what they're doing is they're retrofitting their buildings. If you were gonna retrofit a school, maybe it's too deep of a question, what would be the first part of the school you would focus on if you're gonna retrofit a roof with a green the what? The structure, the basic. Um, no, I'm talking about the roof. Like if, if you, I have a, a whole school, if I want to pick one spot for that school to retrofit, where do you think I'd start? Gym. The gym. So uh, Woodhaven Brownstone, basically they're putting vegetative roofs over their gyms, their pools, their natatoriums, and their cafeterias, basically their biggest heat loss areas. So they, 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 they knew it was expensive to retrofit their entire roof, so they cherry-picked areas they would have the biggest most return on their investment and, and another thing with that that's a, is uh schools that are in the flight path of like o'hare or laguardia like big urban schools they're putting them over classrooms because the noise, decibels, the noise reduction is, yep. is is huge we um i i, um, I worked with uh, st Clair community college to do some green roof monitoring they put a vegetative roof over their performance hall because they were trying to, you know, basically, uh, they, they were they were working on acoustics, and they they, you know, they didn't like the noise, so they actually put it over their performance hall. Barclays that, Barclays Center in Brooklyn yeah. also did that. That's it's actually St. Clair Community College right there. That's their roof. I, I got down low so I can take a cool picture to see them, but that's that's the top of their performance hall. So do you need a staff of gardeners to what maintain it? Nope. So um, it depends on what you want to look like, but at Lawrence Tech, 
Um, we have not done any maintenance on our roof in 15 years. So no weeding? Nope. What we do is about once every other year, we go up there and pull the trees. Because you'll get like you know, cottonwoods, oh, or, like every, you know, we, we make sure the trees come out because that could be destructive. But because it's, it's meant for energy savings and stormwater management, not for garden, we don't, you know, we just, it looks like this. We just let it go. I mean, it's, it, we're not trying to make it look good. A weeds only is, is what you consider right. to be so, a weed, right? Yeah. What, so what we do, what we did at Lawrence Tech and what other people do is the first two years had maintenance. Two years of drip irrigation, two years of weeding to make sure the sedum is what really took hold and made a carpet. And then after that, we just walked away from it. Because to be honest, as long as it's working, we don't care what it looks like. I think it looks beautiful, but other people would not. But right, and you want you want a variety of plants because yeah. different plants transpire at different rates. Yeah. Um, we have seven different sedums on our roof. Yeah, sedums are cam plants, so actually they, they open their stomata at night, so they breathe <laughs> at night. They're like, so they're letting the moisture out at night, and that's when it's coolest, where the, re, the lowest amount of evaporation is happening at that point. So you want to have some grasses mixed in because they transpire during the daytime. So you can recharge your system. You want your sponge, if you think of the roof as a sponge, to dry out mm -hmm. so you can recharge it and manage water in the, when the next rain comes. So that's a good example of what they saw. These are, you can see the grasses in here intermixed with the sedum in this particular plant palette. Um, I'm gonna have to go really fast at this point, but live walls are kind of, a, there's, they can be very aesthetically pleasing, but effectively what you got here is you, you're putting vegetation on the side of buildings you still get that evaporative heating, uh, sorry, that evaporative cooling effect. So the plants pull air from the bottom to the top, so it actually cools your building that way. You can have planter boxes on the bottom, so the planter boxes can hold that water, and then they can work up the tray systems. This here is drip irrigated from the top. You can use a cistern or a rain barrel. It would be a cistern. You can actually capture storm water in a cistern and then drip irrigate through this. So this will capture the water that hits it on an angle, but better yet is these, um, it really should be fed through a drip irrigation system using rainwater harvested. So last couple things here. So this is a, this is a traditional kind of 55 gallon rain barrel, right? You can also do cisterns. So these are larger cistern systems. These are for internal use. So this take, this is um, an apartment building in Detroit. This is a private residence in West Michigan. So this here, um, the water is actually being pulled back into the building and used for gray water reuse, like flushing of toilets, things of that nature. Same with this one, they're using inside to flush toilets. The first ones I showed you were just kind of rain barrels for agriculture on the outside. Um, these are very large cisterns here. These are both being, this is, a under, this is our cistern at Lawrence Tech, it's a 12,000 gallon cistern, pulling that water back into the building, using it to flush toilets. Uh, Ford Fairlane, the Fairlane Town Center, has got large rainwater harvesting systems. You can use it for agriculture, you can use it for irrigation, you can use it for stormwater um, uh, control, you can use it for flushing of the toilets, all of that. It's all rainwater harvesting. One thing I can tell you is that, in, you know, people sometimes balk at me when I say this, but in reality, our water in Michigan is really, really cheap. The economics of rainwater harvesting is not very good. You know, it's a, it's a lot better economics to harvest rainwater in, in Denver and other places. So you might do a cistern for the good of the cause, but you know, if you're looking to cut down on your water bill, it's, it's not from, not this type, not, like, not pulling it back in the building. You're doing this because you want to have a sustainable, you're selling a sustainable brand, right? This apartment complex, they're charging their tenants more money because they're pulling you know, because they can say, hey, you're using rainwater to flush your toilet. Oh, here, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pay higher rent because that's, that's their market, that's their target market. Um, the thing with rain barrels is this can actually save you money because you're not using potable water to water your garden, right? They're cheap and you're not using water to water your garden. This is just, the economics are really tough on this. These are really expensive. It'll take, I've done the math, it'll take you 40, 50 years to get your money back in these kinds of systems. I mean, it just, or maybe yeah. not that long, yeah. but it's well, long. It's long. It's long. <laughs> like off grid homes or somewhere where you don't, it's oh, like yeah. rock underneath and you can't drill them. Yes, that's well. different. Like that, yeah. That's like, that's the yeah, one I, place where. This is places, th these are where you can get municipal water for a penny a gallon. That, that's what this is. Right. That, that's what I'm referring to. Right. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm being over generalizing. <laughs> yeah, there are places where it, uh, it, the economics would be different. But um, both of these were done in, um, in where urban water was available to them. It's just the, the money, low flow, low flow toilets, low flush toilets, you get your money out of those. But gray water reuse systems are just kind of expensive. 
All right, so this is the last slide. I'd like to throw this one up here to basically say I've shown you seven, no, nine, like that, nine different green infrastructure techniques. And people, you know, you have to actually think about all of these things, right? What kind of maintenance is it? How hard is it going to be to construct? What's it going to cost? Where is it located? Is it in a back alley or is it in my downtown? Is it at my resident? Is it you know, where I have urban uh, water? Um, you know, am I gonna, can I actually capture the rainwater and use it? You know, can I get some dual use out of it? Place making, make it look good. What are my water quality needs? What are my water quantity needs? All of these things are gonna play a role before you decide what green infrastructure you wanna do. Um, I have a whole bunch of pictures, but we're at dinner time right now. Yeah. So um, I, might be, I might blow through a few more pictures later because we do have two more sessions. So the rest of these are just case studies.